Good afternoon, uh, dear friends, dear colleagues. We are continuing with this uh, the 2021 African Dialogue Series, co-organized by the Office of Special Advisor on Africa, or SAA, and African Union Commission and UNESCO, under the theme African Cultural Identity and the Ownership uh, Reshaping Mindset. The target of this uh, discussion, the series of uh, debate and dialogue this year is really to amplify and promote global advocacy of African Union themes of 2021 that you know that art, culture, heritage leave us for building the Africa we want. And uh, we are now in this uh, second themes of this dialogue, which is harnessing culture and heritage for economic transformation. We look into the role of culture, cultural heritage in driving economic transformation. So I have a great, four great panelists with me today. I'm going to start to introduce the first one, Harriet uh, Diakon. She's a visiting research fellow of Coventry University, UK, and a honorary research fellow at the University of Cape Town, South Africa. She's specializing in intangible heritage and cultural property law. She trained in uh, history and anthropology at the University of Cape Town and worked as a Rob, at, work at a Robben Island Museum as researcher coordinator in the uh, late 90s and early 2000. She has published widely on laws, culture, including international, including international journal, journal of Cultural Property and the International Journal of Heritage Studies. So Harris, maybe I will uh, start with, with you a little bit. Uh, how did you, from these studies, coming to this idea of cultures and uh, economy, maybe? You can start there. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. It's uh, great to be on the panel. Um, so, as you say, my background is in cultural heritage and uh, while working as a facilitator for UNESCO on the Global Capacity Building Programme, under the 2003 Convention for Intangible Heritage. I did workshops in various uh, countries around the world and many people asked me how can we make money out of our cultural heritage while still protecting it. And uh, the conversation on commercialization and how to manage it in the heritage field is, is very weak at the moment. So I started looking at how various countries are, are dealing with the problem. Kenya now has a very interesting new act, Traditional Knowledge Act, giving communities the legal rights to control exploitation of their traditional knowledge or cultural expressions. And I also started uh, working on projects in India and Kyrgyzstan, uh, looking at HIPAMs or heritage sensitive intellectual property and marketing strategies that try to really help communities of cultural workers uh, engage with the market in a, in a way that also protects their heritage and livelihoods. So that's really where my interest in this area comes from. Th thank you very much, Harold. That is very, very interesting. Yeah, when I read a little bit of your of your the one one of the work the, I mean, the work you've done i've seen that we have really developed this uh, very interesting you know mechanism with some important issues so that the second question is how how the role of culture be leveraged to transform across economy social and environmental dimension how do you link this in the work you have uh, those issues of governance and culture, which you have, uh, you have uh, thoroughly developed. Hmm. Uh, thanks for the question. I, I, at the HIPAMS project that I've been involved in, um, we developed a model that I think can really be quite useful in the African context. And uh, what we've done is identified four key issues that are useful in thinking about the engagement between cultural uh, uh, industries and economic transformation. And the first issue is governance and empowerment of cultural workers. Secondly is the, the cultural heritage repertoire, including the values or the knowledge or skills that we've got. Uh, thirdly, reputation, uh, how it's seen by us and others. 
and finally uh, heritage sensitive innovation and I think what what these four concepts help us to do is to think about how economic development is linked to human and social development in the sort of SDGs framework. And it, it helps to show how the economic value of cultural goods is linked to their cultural value and how that cultural value gets communicated. So um, ultimately, it helps us to think about um, you know, holistically how cultural workers engage with the market. So if we think about governance and empowerment, for example, uh, workers in the culture sector often are quite poorly remunerated and they don't uh, always work as a collective. They're small traders, effectively. And so how can we support them through things like fair trade principles, collective organizations, and so on? So in the High Pamps project, we found that providing cultural workers with rights training helping them to register intellectual property rights, such as geographical indications, and developing fair, fair trade style codes of ethics for cultural goods. It really yeah. gave them negotiating power in the market. So that was, you know, one of the areas that we uh, felt was beneficial. And then the other issue is in terms of heritage repertoire, uh, yeah. we found artists and cultural creators tend to take their cultural background for granted and and not to really explain it to other people. So thinking about how your cultural assets, the roots of your heritage, link to the things that you put in the market, the fruits, um, is a good way of helping people to think about the special cultural heritage skills and meanings associated with products. And we found in the High Pamps project that doing this actually helped cultural workers to make a more interesting uh, proj product because they started using things that they were, that were from their roots that they hadn't always, you know, like songs or or other aspects of the cultural heritage that they hadn't um, been using as frequently in their products. Then thirdly, reputation. It's really important to think about the value that's placed on cultural heritage by the communities that make it and by customers. And, and that affects the price in the market as well as you know, people's interest in carrying on doing it. And in the, in the High Pamps project, we found that communicating cultural value was an important aspect of reputation in the market. And it was a way of distinguishing heritage crafts from mass produced goods in the cheap souvenir market. Okay. So it helped artists to charge more. Um, and then the final one on heritage sensitive innovation, you know, simply being confident in the roots of culture and tradition and the value of the artist's choice and voice in changing things enables culturally sensitive innovation. And so in the High Pamps project, we found that talking about the roots of culture and heritage helped artists to engage and play more with uh, their heritage uh, products and, uh, and help them to create new products uh, in, for the market. So th those are the kind of some of the insights that we got from the High Pamps project. Thank you very much, Harold. This is a very, very interesting. I'll come back to you now, you in the second round, and you tell me what kind of policy and action you, you, are, you are proposing for this. Now, Patrick, we have another speaker. Who's Patrick? He's a native of Uganda, and he's a, he's a musician, conducting musician, musical workshop, researching on the role of music, and uh, he has performed in various places, including in Cairo, Hong Kong, London, and uh, Monitaba, Washington. And uh, for him, music is not only a forum of for entertainment, but uh, a vehicle of for communication. Patrick, how do you come from how do you come from the music to to the culture? Of course, it's culture, but to transformation and economy. How do you link that? Can you unmute your mic, Patrick? Yeah. Am I unmuted now? Yeah, then, yes, please. Yeah. 
Yes, yes. Uh, uh, first of all, um, uh, Mr. Moderator, thank you so much uh, for uh, having us here and for moderating this event. And um, I'm delighted to be participating in this partly. This is a topic so close to my heart. And I want to also thank the United Nations Office of a Special Advisor on Africa uh, in collaboration with the African Union and UNESCO for having us here to discuss these important matters. Uh, now, before I also talk about my background, I'm sure all of you know about the fire in South Africa, which has really destroyed many, many uh, um, artifacts um, and its staff and stable. And our hearts uh, go to the people of Cape Town and, of course, the university. And I hope um, a lot will yeah. be done to try to recover as much as we can. Please. Now, on, yeah. our, on my background, I grew up in Uganda um, uh, around the seven hills of Kampala. And uh, as I like to say, I grew up in two worlds because um, there was a world where political turmoil and economic difficulties were always so present, as they still do in many parts of Africa and elsewhere. And that was a tough world to keep up with. But then on the other hand, I grew up in a world where music really provided uh, the breathing space. Uh, and in music, I could find a spiritual uh, support and well-being and mental um, sort of a focus. Um, but also, I started to actually make a living teaching piano. As you probably know, many rich people in Africa and elsewhere sometimes have these pianos, but they can't play them. So they will invite me to go teach them <laughs> piano their home, at their homes. But also, I performed uh, at many events and also um, around churches. So this was, I quickly could see that I could make a living as a musician. Now, this was going against the grain because most of our time, as I'll probably discuss later, I was like, oh, music, there's no money in music. Don't go there, don't go there. But then for me, actually, uh, I could realize that there was this area where music helped me stay focused because all around Ellis, things were tough. So I, those two worlds I talk about, I think, is where what got me yeah. interested in the background of music and how it can be used for economic and social transformation. Thank you, Padre. Now, now you come to a point very, very interesting because you're talking about uh, social transformation. So what are the examples of effective strategy for maximizing the role of culture in promotion of social and economic participation and transformation, especially for those vulnerable like you as in particular as women and youth? What, I what think, are the uh, yeah. yeah, go please. ahead. Yeah, please. Uh, I think one of our areas we have to look at, I think maybe Harriet or you uh, mentioned it a little bit in the beginning, the issue of mindset, changing mindsets. And I think this is a type of our theme has the word reshaping minds. We always yeah. think that music will take you nowhere. You're going to be stupid as a musician. Or artists, you're stuck there. Don't become a writer. We need more Chona Chibes in, from Africa. We need a lot of people who are architects, who are, and their talent is incredibly there. Many young people want to contribute, but we partition them to be in this way that become an accountant, uh, finance. And there's nothing wrong with that, but we have to realize that we all have different gifts. And we should allow our students and the curriculum to actually absorb that. And actually, that's where creativity and innovation will come in. So public policy, in this case, as we'll talk about later, is to realize that, okay, this is uh, something we have profoundly really rich and great. Africa is not all about copper and gold and minerals like that. This is all there, but the creativity and heritage is so rich that opening up our minds and accepting this as part of the African uh, agenda for transformation, I think can give us miracles, as you've probably seen, because many young people still create, but in a very tight space, as some of you may be aware. So what about if we really actually absorb this and allow this to flourish as the way it can? Thank you very much. And, and as I say, I will very much like, uh, Patrick, you, those complexity that you have described, you know, vulnerability in terms of, you know, art in Africa, that Africa is not only gold and mine and the other thing. I really like to see how do we, how do we, you know, formulate them in strategy and election. I'll come there later for that one. Now I'm going to okay. the, the third uh, panelist, is Dr. George Abungu. I mean, he's uh, well known in this one area of, of, of heritage. And here also, before I go to introduce you, Dr. Abungo, I want also to really kind of 
put this piece and parcel together. So George Abungu is a, is a Cambridge Town archaeologist and Emirate Director of uh, National Museum of Kenya. He's the founding chairman of African 209, for, that is a, a kind of uh, activity that has trained, I think, half of the practitioner today in Africa and the International uh, Standard Committee of Traffic Illicit. He's also founder of this uh, one important in institute in Nairobi, you know, Center for Heritage Development, uh, Heritage and Development in Africa. He's also a recipient of IFE Prize in Museum in 2007. He has set a World Monument Watch panel for World Monument Fund in New York, and there was a Kenya representative of UNESCO World Heritage Committee and vice president of uh, the Bureau between 2004 and 2008. And he's a now a founding professor of, he, he is a founding professor of Heritage Studies at University of Mauritius and currently serve as a special, special advisor to the director of uh, ICROM in, in, uh, in, uh, in Italy. George, this, theme of uh, UN, uh, of, uh, um, in, uh, African Union is art, culture, and heritage. We combine art, culture, and heritage in what it believe of, 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 of Africa we want. From your background, how do you link these three things? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Juma. I hope that uh, the internet will be consistent because I've been in and out, in and out, so I've watched only a half of that. But uh, since we are starting with our backgrounds, I just want to say I am in the museum world, uh, rising from uh, a trainee all the way to Director General of National Museums of Kenya. Institution uh, of over 1,500 people employed, and it carries research uh, ranging from culture to biomedical studies, so it's very diverse. Uh, my interest as an archaeologist has always been on people and uh, how uh, communities relate uh, to their heritage. And of course, Africa has had a, a very checkered experience in that we were colonized. And so things have not been very smooth. We've always tended to have for too long uh, people uh, talking for us rather than uh, talking with us. Uh, and, and I think that growing up in the museum system in Kenya did teach me that uh, heritage has power to contribute to communities. And uh, when I saw the uh, opportunity to promote, you know, uh, our own narrative from Africa for Africa uh, being developed by uh, United Nations and, and, and the UNESCO and African Union, I was very, I felt very privileged to be part of this because I think if you do it for me without me, you are against me. Uh, and and, and, and uh, that has always been my, my, my feeling that when you work with the communities, you, you actually develop those capacities that are embedded uh, in, in their heritage. And uh, working like that, uh, not doing for them, but working with them, so that you can pull them out and, and, and make sure that you get the best out of it. There is a lot of potential. Uh, I just want to say yesterday that I was talking about uh, 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 culture and, uh, and sustainable development. And when I was going through uh, the sustainable development goals, the 17 of them, I realized that culture, although not specifically mentioned, applies directly to 11 of them which means including partnership, which is this number 17, including poverty alleviation, which is uh, the first one, and uh, issues of peace and conflict resolution. All those are cultural issues that uh, culture and heritage directly contributes to. So being a, a, a museum and the museum in Kenya being in charge of heritage, I interact very closely with the communities, and through that, we were able to develop a number of projects with them to uh, try uh, in terms of built heritage, like in Zanzibar, Mr. Yuma worked with you in that area, and you know yes. that. Uh, where I've also worked with Harriet 
uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Mauritius in developing a number of uh, nomination dossiers, uh, one of them being uh, Gitgiwai, uh, which is a traditional uh, dance at weddings, but which now is actually used by the communities to bring them together and also for uh, commercial and economic purposes without actually uh, destroying the very heritage that, uh, that, that they value. So I think it's been through experimental, through experience, through uh, working with communities and learning from the communities, not developing policies at a, that high level, but really yeah. learning at that community level, asking questions of if we talk about traditional knowledge system, what are we talking about? How have people managed this? How have they used it? How have they maintained it? Can we actually use those mechanisms that they have used to apply to the current situation? And so my, my, my intention and my, my focus has always been learning from community, working with the community, and then trying to see how we can fit it in the present situation where we are talking about sustainable development or uh, you know, the Agenda 2063 or the African model law that all talk about heritage as a resource but heritage also as a, a powerful tool for development. Um, so in short, my background basically has been to learn from the communities and work with them. Thank you very much, George, because you have uh, you have uh, really read my mind because uh, I, I wanted also to ask you a second question. Maybe I can put it so you can expand a little bit. But uh, what are the best practice and lesson learned in promoting those uh, local solution and innovation to, to tackle SDG, um, SDG challenges? I know you've already started to, to go this, but can you go more practical? I'm, I'm not sure if George listened. I mean, he has, but we'll come back to we'll come back to that point because he has he had already started to discuss that you know the learning from local solution and it's good here that people they you know our who are listening to us they really they could see some typical solution that he has developed in Mauritius in Zanzibar in, in Kenya when it comes to innovation and approach of SDG as, as he say that we have to we have to hear from those local people. Now I'll go to the fourth. Uh, panelist, Dr. Ismail. Dr. Ismail is a, is a, is a PhD holder is a, um, um, in a, um, ethnology, geography, and Islamic study from uh, Beirut University, Federal Republic of uh, from Beirut University, Federal Republic of German. Since uh, 2007, he has been a director of uh, general director general of House of uh, Heritage. L, L, and uh, FLI Training Center, Khatoum, and uh, he is also FLI Art, Culture, Media and Promotion and uh, Documentation. Dr. Fila is a member of various boards, including Sudan National Council for Heritage and Language Development, Evaluation of Arab, he is also part of Evaluation of Arab Heritage Prices, established by Arab League of Education. Hello, yes. Yes, I now I can hear you. Please, Doc Smile, if you if you hit me, if you heard me, can you just uh, start it as I said to give us just a little bit of background of uh, your study and uh, your relation now to this uh, idea of art, culture, and the development? Can you can you go back a little bit to give us background, and then I wanted to ask you a specific question related to institutions, please. Yes, thank you very much. Thanks, of course, to the African Union and to the UNESCO for organizing these uh, meetings, and uh, to you and uh, my colleagues. Uh, I studied in Sudan and in Egypt. I studied uh, sociology and anthropology and folklore, and then I completed in, uh, in Germany. In Bayreuth University, I did my PhD there in uh, ethnology, geography, and uh, Islamic studies. Uh, <clears throat> I worked in Sudan in the Folklore Research Center until 1985. Then I joined uh, Bayreuth. Uh, Bayreuth University in 1985. 
military government in Sudan. Then I returned now to Sudan and established this house of heritage. Uh, also, I work as a facilitator, as my colleague Harry, on, uh, for the UNESCO. And during the last four years, we managed to do a very good job here in Sudan. I, I facilitated, of course, in other countries outside, in Egypt, Jordan, uh, uh, and the Arab Gulf countries, Saudi Arabia. But during the last four years, we've been working in Sudan. We were able to train uh, 200 plus young people in the field of uh, heritage, community uh, participation, and uh, inventorying, and uh, also nomination of. Uh, elements to the UNESCO list. It is a very good job. Moreover, we were able also to write for the first time in Sudan a strategy and a policy for the safeguarding of the tangible cultural heritage. This is in the part of heritage, but also we have some work on, the, on culture. You can, in general. Rejoin. you can rejoin using the we link. Are the, yeah. Yes, we are working on a strategy also for uh, culture. And because now Sudan, you know, is uh, facing uh, many, many difficulties. So okay. this is the role of culture and heritage is very important for us. Okay. Yes. Th thank you very much, Ismail. Now, Dr. Ismail, I wanted to ask you a specific question when it comes to you and George, you are, you know, people who are working in, in institution. Now, specifically, we say strong, effective, and inclusive institution yeah, and, uh, and uh, at all levels are critical and enabler for accelerating, you know, decade of action for SDG. So how cultural con con can uh, contribute to build institution and uh, that are responsive and uh, for the need of citizen and uh, especially those, those who are vulnerable? and considering the situation of Sudan as well. Yes, maybe you know that Sudan, like many other uh, countries in this region, they have, uh, during the last uh, four decades, they have uh, great difficulties, especially from the drought and uh, uh, of the 1990s, 80s and 90s. And many people started migrating from their homeland to the capital, Khartoum, and to other major cities. This is also from neighboring countries. Thousands of people migrated into Sudan and pushed other groups to the Khartoum. From 1990, we had very bad governance in Sudan, very fanatic. They did not respect religious or uh, ethnic uh, diversity or uh, human rights during this period, and this uh, led to a civil war in southern Sudan, in Darfur, and uh, Kurdufan, West, uh, South Kurdufan, and the Blue Nile to the border of Ethiopia. All these places, they witnessed uh, civil war, and many people started also migrating to, to the capital and to other places in Sudan. Now, the major thing that we are facing now is how to how culture and heritage. Maybe we'll, we'll, we'll go back to Dr. Ismail later because we cannot yes. hear from him now. Okay. I'll, I'll come back to you, I mean, Dr. Ismail, for that. Now I wanted to, to go you. to the, I want to go to another round and uh, here I want to really now to kind of go with a more of general and uh, to give to give uh, those uh, how to say inspiration for transformation for policy and, and action I'll go back to to Harriet in you are in your example Harriet when we talk about this hippomas you have really come up with a kind of strategic policy and some actions so I wanted to, to ask you what are the best practice? in strengthening the contribution of cultural heritage to create an enabling environment for sustainable drawing, sustainable development, drawing from 
Africa experience, but you experience you have worked with other countries which is not uh, Africans in implementing 2030, but especially in implementing Agenda 2023. Harit. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Mohammed. Um, I, I want to come back to what George was saying earlier about attitudes and approaches and what Patrick also touched on. And I feel that um, there's some attitudinal shifts that we can really uh, need to encourage in the African uh, policy space in this area. And the first issue is to think about the, the way we value African cultural heritage, uh, both locally as well as how we project that value internationally. And I think as, as George was saying, you know, we have a history of, of colonialism in Africa where African culture was denigrated, was often suppressed, even made illegal. And even today, I think there's a legacy of that in that arts and culture are often seen as kind of secondary. They're seen as a, a drain on government resources in some countries still. And Africans still import far more creative goods than they export. Um, I think we need to start thinking about African culture as a kind of soft power, which which many other countries, uh, you know, uh, do so. And the continent, as a continent in Africa, we can uh, see it as soft power for the continent as a whole, as well as starting to differentiate and think about our specific localities, our specific countries within Africa. And then secondly, I think we must think more about investing in, uh, in the cultural sector for sustainable development, not just extracting. And again, this comes back to uh, what the others were saying around sort of moving away from the idea of, of a, it as a gold mine, as a resource that's to be mined. So what actually, what are the practical steps that can be taken? Um, and I think that the idea of promoting cultural fair trade is very important. And the, there are mechanisms for doing so. Um, and, and that should sit on top of a kind of a sense in which we invest in cultural workers. You know, places like India are actually giving, uh, are seeing cultural promotion as part of their rural development strategies where artists get pensions and insurance. Um, and uh, I think policies uh, at the national level in Africa can also help to protect artists from exploitation and misappropriation. Um, but I think our mistake there is where we have, in, for example, in Kenya introduced um, new acts. So South Africa has done the same and Zambia to protect traditional knowledge. Um, we don't always help communities to benefit from that. And so how do we actually make sure that those things can be implemented at the community level? Because as George said, it's all about making sure the community level is fed and, and protected. Um, there could, from a policy point of view, also be much greater attention to codes of ethics and sort of ethical trade. And that can be particularly important with the new continental free trade agreement, making sure that some of these ideas are infused in some of the um, continental approaches to trade. Thank, thank, thank you. I had one more point. Sorry. Please, Mohammed. please. Yeah, it? please. Yeah. I think that um, what we found in the High Pams project is that it wasn't enough just to support cultural workers by, um, you know, helping them to form a cooperative and so on. Actually, cultural sector needs very tailored marketing, financial, IP support to make sure that they make the most out of uh, cultural products and services. And it particularly, I think, especially in the time of COVID, to help artists to, to move online, to do more activities online, to take advantage of the digital revolution as access becomes easier across the continent. And I think this is a really important point. Um, Finally, I think that cultural heritage needs to be playing a bigger part in continental branding. So branding the continent as a cultural hub 
as Patrick was saying, you know, there's so much richness and wealth, but we're not always communicating that, especially at the international level. We need a kind of much more comprehensive strategy on that. And we need to be calling on the African diaspora to help us, not just in that branding exercise, but also supporting local cultural industries by creating market linkages with them. So those are my suggestions on a policy level. Thank you very much, Harry. This is really, this really fantastic. Patrick, if I come to you with the same question, what are the best practice in strengthening you know contribution of cultural in creating enabling environment for implementing the agenda 2063 africa we want i think uh, i will go with the issue of arts education partly because my mother was a teacher and also i've been teaching for a number of years and i have many people who are also professors and teachers and educators but as i think nelson mandela said to go back to South Africa. Education is one of our most powerful tools, I think he said, to change the world. I think the issue of arts education is so important because it's the foundation. And here why, is why it's so important, because right now you're going to see that in Africa, they're promoting STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, and math. And that's being promoted with abandon. It's the same model here, I think, in the United States. Is, in the United States, it's the same thing. Assuming that arts don't have space in there but actually if you add the a you have steam which is actually going to move things forward this is why this is so important um stem is not really just for the sake of it we want this to translate to get to local communities to how does this link to people's uh, well-being and creativity and innovation and the last time i looked which is all the time innovation and creativity which we are talking about really stem from arts education so it's not right to say that you know students don't study math, or don't study music, don't study the arts because you are not going to make money, and eliminating the arts. So the African curriculum. Imagine if Sudan, Uganda, South Africa said you cannot graduate with a high school diploma without having taken such and such courses in the arts. This is one of a very very important things we need to do. And any other things that will fall into the trap of looking at education for. Uh, economic gain only, that what they may call human capital. I really prefer human capability, which Mamatia Sen and others have said. When you look at human capability, you're not going to promote the arts because you're not going to make money. Because assumption in mine, in my example experience, it's like, oh, don't go to music. Don't go into writing. There's no money there. Forgetting that there are other creative mm -hmm. endeavors or other things which actually education supports. And if you want to look that, at that linkage of really looking at um, how the arts can help us be more innovative and how can we bring about economic transformation, the arts are very, very important. And I think uh, this will help us then look at even the issue of languages, which I've repeatedly talked about, that as we grew up, all of us being beaten for speaking our native languages. Now, yeah. research showing that, oh, actually, if you do st uh, speak or uh, know many more language languages, it's actually good for your brain. <laughs> yeah. But then we're talking about heritage and the arts and that can music being an international language, arts themselves are languages and how can we embrace all this in arts education? And I think that kind of education is also with branding, teaching the world or the world learning more about Africa's education has to offer. My second point will look about the issue of international culture financing. Because the many young people I talk to are about Africa, one of the things they are lacking is funding. As you saw, many funding opportunities are not created equal. Even here in the United States, it's all about Silicon Valley for the most part. So how can we create ways in which you can finance creative people in Africa or creative startups? I think Ariet also just mentioned something like this. And this also touches on the issue of how we can look at what a colleague of mine at the World Bank called the foreign direct cultural investment. This issue came about when we were writing a piece for the Guardian on why it's important to return African art home. And the issue was normally like, oh, how are we going to take care of this? How can we finance this? But imagine we have something like the foreign culture, um, direct cultural investment, which is really mimicking like, like a sort of FDI, where you have all this funding to go into trying to uh, making sure our museums work well, the work George is doing. I, I hope George maybe will tell us more how he does get his funding and how really make sure that this is collaborative with all over the globe. So for example, in South Africa, with this fire yeah. happening yeah. at Cape Town, how are we going to make sure 
that will rebuild? Where can we get funding for that? And then okay. finally, I'll, I'll touch on the issue of intellectual property. I think that many, for example, in Norwood, at uh, the last time I was looking at the research, is that they lose a lot of money uh, from piracy. Now, this is a complicated issue because copyright can go both ways. But no. imagine we have a framework where we can support collection agencies in a fair and inclusive manner to making sure that even from Norwood to the Maasai people, people are compensated fairly for their creative output. Thank you very, thank you very much, Pratik. Now, I come to Dr. Abungu. From the very outset, you put a basis of local solution. It has to start from Africa. Now, what the best practice in strengthening the contribution of cultural heritage to creating an enable environment for sustainable development, especially drawing from what you say, it has to come from Africa in implementing Agenda 2063. You are muted, George, I think. Or maybe it's not, yeah. Uh, I'm just yeah. saying that, let me restate again that I am a, a great believer yeah. on grassroots and on community capacity to be able to lead. Uh, and for Africa is something very special because we live culture, we breathe culture. And uh, it's not something that we talk as if it's uh, outside our life, we practice it. So that is an advantage. The problem with policymakers that we do have is that they don't listen. We hardly listen because we think we know everything. And so we do for them without knowing that culture is something that has grown over years. It's been made for generations and it is actually within those communities. So if we do care to listen, we'll be able to reap a lot. And I'll give a few examples. Uh, but first, before I do that, I would like to say there are a number of issues that I think we need to take into consideration. First is identification. We need to go into the community and identify what is there. Secondly, I think is recognition. We need to recognize that knowledge. We need to recognize the power of the heritage that these people hold even at village level. Thirdly, I think is support. We need to support them to maximize in what they have. And all these need a mind change, a mind, a mind, a mind, mind mindset change. We need to develop totally a new paradigm shift. We need to de decolonize you people. We are talking about the way we have been brought out or brought up, whereby even our language is not recognized. If you speak it, then you sort of pick it on the side and you don't want anybody to hear it. You can only do that by decolonizing our mind, by decolonizing the process of education, by decolonizing the practices the way we have always done. And we can only do that if we connect with the community and listen to them. So listening is very important. Now, let's take the issue of the uh, SDG. What are some of the key issues? One is environment. In Africa, culture has always been very protective of environment. And from Kenya, where I come from, let me give you an example that you know, a wild heritage site called the Kayas. These are sacred forests, okay? They have been managed by communities. These are one of the few places which are listed under two UNESCO conventions, the 2003 Intangible Convention and the 1972 Convention. There are very few in the world. Why? Because the communities have always appreciated the environment. And through them, the botanists and the zoologists and others have carried a lot of research in terms of medicinal plants, also using community knowledge. Over different, about eight different places have been found that have never been found there because these places have been protected. So when you are talking about environmental protection and SDG, and you don't talk about the Kaya. What are you talking about? The second one is the issue of climate change. We are not looking at this because climate change, there are so many places in, in Africa where communities have been fighting over resources, dry areas, semi-desert areas, 
Look at Sudan, look at Somalia, look at Northern Kenya, look at the Sahara. But through that, they have also developed traditional systems of peace and conflict resolution. But we are not going into that and studying this and using that, yet we want to deal with them. Now, climate change is going to create a lot of problems if things are not addressed. Apart from the problems of just the environment and how we are going to sustain ourselves, it's going to create conflict. If we go back to communities, can we be able to understand their traditional knowledge systems of conflict resolution and in put that as part of a government policy which can be supported, documented, and utilized among them create a situation where they can coexist even with all these influences of climate change that is you know, uh, affecting them. Third, and the National Museums has worked on that and even published books on conflict resolution among pastoralists. We can use. The third one is on town planning and urban settlements. Tanzania and uh, Zanzibar, where you come from, you are in charge of town planning. Yes. I come from Kenya. I help put world, I mean, uh, Lamu as a world heritage. But one thing that I'm so proud of is that we realized that once we had done that, what else could we do? Because the traditional knowledge system, the architectural knowledge, the way in which they treated their, their architecture, the way they, 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 they produced their you know, artwork and you know, other, other things that go with it, was disappearing. So the National Museums working with the government of Kenya developed a policy which then recommended that we needed to set up a training school to revive and develop Swahili culture. And this became one of the most successful places that brought uh, European Union in, ILO, uh, UNDP, the Kenya government. And through this institution, so many people were able to actually revive this culture and to be trained in masonry, in art, and in all kinds of things. And I can tell you, these are the people who now own businesses in Mombasa and Lamu, and are the ones who are managing this world heritage. They're the ones who are actually res restoring houses in these particular places. That is a tangible, sustainable aspect of conservation, which relies on culture, its recognition, and support. Which I want to very quickly, which uh, Patrick and Harriet have also mentioned, is yeah. the issue of traditional knowledge systems. South Africa you've had an experience with the knowledge systems of medicinal plants, where companies come from outside, work with the communities, take that knowledge, use it, develop you know, uh, medicinal plant, me medicines and, and other things, and, and forget about the communities. And yet this is a millennium known you know, knowledge that communities have nurtured over the years as a resource. And you had in South Africa to fight for it and to make them be recognized. Those are the type of policy uh, actions that we need, where governments listen to the communities, understand what they do, the resources that they have in terms of cultural heritage and other heritage, and try to promote them without looking down upon them. But as I say, because we have this mentality, a colonized mentality, we have to start from ourselves by decolonizing that and recognizing that on that particular village, on that particular home, on that particular location, we have resources in terms of heritage that is lived, is practiced, and has been practiced, and we can go there and get those resources and make them become commercial, viable, and supportive communities that for generations have nurtured them. So it's a okay. question of listening, recognizing, doing, supporting, and making sure that they are embedded in policies that we develop. Thank you very much, Dr. Bong. That was excellent. Now I come to Dr. Ismail, the same question. With your experience of uh, institutionalization, what are the best practices in strengthening contribution of cultural heritage to create a enabling environment for sustainable development, drawing in a new experience in implementing, of course, 2030, but at the same time, Agenda 2063?
You are muted, Dr. Smile. Can you unmute your mic? Still, we cannot hear you. Your mic is muted. Not yet. Yes, now yes. Yes. Hello? Now yes, please. Yeah. Yes. Well, I said I do agree with uh, my colleagues what they have been saying, especially about these environmental issues and the movement of people. This has affected, the drought affected the many many people moved from their places and then they, there was conflict between uh, different groups and now uh, we are working hard on uh, showing that there are many that intangible heritage has made a lot of practices and values for peace and uh, for tolerance between these groups and uh, how people they can come to, uh, to a, a sort of an agreement but then we have another problem now in Sudan. That is, the, with the, during the last years, there is very high percentage of unemployment among the youth. And that uh, culture and heritage can, be, uh, can play a big role in this. We are working on this field and in uh, cultural and innovative uh, industries. And we think that also because many people now in the rural area they can uh, also benefit from uh, these projects we are working hard also in the traditional uh, medication system traditional medication system is very important with the mega resources in sudan and we are uh, thinking also and working also with this intellectual property rights for certain groups we are concerned more with the traditional sector. That is, this is farmers and uh, herders in the traditional sector. All these years, this is people, they, they have been exploited by the people in the, in the town. Now, we, in the last percentage that we received that the people who dig the gum Arabic, which is a big resource, the farmers get only 15% out of the income. And the rest, 85% goes to the big companies in Khartoum and uh, abroad. So we are working hard also how the traditional knowledge in this place will help. Tourism also, now in Sudan, after uh, the revolution, now we are working hard also in, and use the intangible cultural heritage, as Harriet before said, we have, of course, not over commercialization, but we work hard with, uh, in the sector of uh, tourism and uh, the cultural and creative uh, studies. The, we are looking forward, of course, the people from uh, Kenya and Uganda and uh, South Africa and other countries of Sudan, they have done in Nigeria, for example, also, they, they did very good with this uh, uh, cultural and creative studies, uh, cultural and creative industries. So we can, uh, we would love to have uh, and know about your experience in this field. And we are looking forward to that for uh, some sort of cooperation between the African countries in this field. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ismail. Now I think we, are, we have, we have uh, finished our, our, our time. And I really wanted to thank uh, all of you, Dr. Harriet Dekon and Patrick Kabanga, Dr. George Abungu and Dr. Ismail. If I really can take from what you've said, I have five, like five keywords. But the most important one that all of you have reported is local. We have to go to local. We have to listen to them. This is extremely important. They have knowledge, we have to listen to them, but we have to value them also. They have a lot of things that are doing. If we don't value those, 
local value, if you don't value those culture, it's really we cannot go anywhere. But governance also is very, very, we have to govern, but because there is exploitation, but we, we have to do that. So we have to listen, as George said, mindset. We have to go out of this decolonized mindset to do something, something which is very, very important. So local value, listening, innovation, and governance. For, for me, those are the very key ones. And thank you very much, colleague. And then I think you start, we'll stop here. Thank you very much and bye-bye. Uh,